put your hands together and let's give a Texas welcome to Professor Seigert. Welcome. I'm very happy to spend this Sabbath in Houston. And I want to talk a little bit about the Philistines. The Philistines who, according to the Bible, have a very bad rap. Uh, the word Philistine came into the English language with a very negative connotation. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is what happened to the Philistines. It's a project that uh, I began many years ago with my colleague, Professor Trudy Dotan of the Hebrew University. We started way back in 1982, and we spent another 14 seasons on and off until 1996, and then left the field and planned something like 15 or 20 years for publication. So thus far, we have 144 articles published, seven preliminary reports, one final report, and this year we have six more in press, the rest to follow in 2013 and 14. That's for my colleagues from the academic world. What I want to talk to you about tonight is what happened to the Philistines, what our, our concepts about them have been, and how our project has helped to change the understanding of the Philistines. And you'll tell me afterwards in your questions and answers whether or not uh, I have uh, succeeded. First of all, what do we know about the Philistines? What did we know before the, the Tel Mikna Ekron excavations began? We knew from the Egyptian text, we knew something from the Bible, that the Philistines were called one of the tribes of the Sea Peoples. They came from the Aegean, they came from the West. Uh, they encountered the Egyptians in Libya and Egypt itself, and then eventually were settled on what we call the Philistine coast of Canaan, or present-day Israel, the southern coast of that country. Uh, and most historians and archaeologists, for many, many years, when they talked about the Philistines, wrote that they came around 1200 in BCE, and they lived in the Philistine coast in the major cities of Ashkelon, and Gats, and Ekron, uh, and Gaza, and they disappeared about 1000 BCE at the time that we associated with the approach of the united monarchy of, of David and, and, and Solomon, and they seemed to disappear at that point. And this was basically the outline of the Philistines that we knew about based on what archaeologists and historians uh, thought for many, many years. But the Ekron excavations and subsequently other excavations at Ashkelon and Tel Asafi and the publications from Ashdod show that that was not the case. In fact, what we did, we were able to document 400 more years of Philistine occupation that is from about 1000 BCE to about 600 BCE. And in that documentation, we were able to discern the process that the Philistines went through, something that I will call the dual process of continuity and acculturation, a tension between those two particular parts of the process. So all of this we were able to prove from our excavations. And then finally, we came up with the idea or the thought of what happened to the Philistines after their 600 years of occupation uh, in the Philistine uh, coastal plain. And this is what my, our story is. This is how we've changed the perception of the Philistines. Now, we've changed it amongst academics, people who read our very exciting papers and various journals, but we haven't quite changed that perception in the general history books because it takes a long time for this kind of documentation to get into the, the, the books that the general public reads. So you'll have to take my word that we've actually changed our understanding of who the Philistines were. They were not as negative a, a people as the Bible portrays, uncircumcised, violent, uh, the worshiper of uh, pagan gods. They were probably many of those things, but they were also a very sophisticated and highly technological society that eventually warped into uh, tribes that came from the West and over a period of time developed into very important industrialists, basically dealing with the olive oil uh, industry. So this is what we, we knew about the Philistines before, and this is basically what I think we know about them uh, today. Now, before we go any further, I want to answer a question that's always asked by people who listen to these lectures. Why did you choose a particular site to excavate? Uh, what were the reasons? Well, if we look at the map, you'll see where Ekron is. 
where the arrow is pointing. And one of the reasons that we chose the site to excavate, because it's on the border between the green and the brown, between the coastal plain where the Philistines settled and the brown area where the Israelites were living in the Shvela or the, the low hills of Judah. We wanted a site where there would be conflict, a border site would be a perfect place to see what the differences were between the Israelites, the Judeans, and uh, the Philistines. That's one reason why we chose it. A second reason is that we were not just interested in what happened at one site, but we wanted to have a comparison with other sites in Philistia and with Judah. In other words, we wanted a regional project. And what was Ashdod, a, a famous Philistine site that had been excavated, so there was material from Ashdod. Ashkelon was going into the field when we began, and we could compare our materials with the, that excavated at Ashkelon. And then there were sites in the Israelite area like Gezer, which is being excavated today by Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. We had excavated there for 10 years in the 60s and 70s. And there were a host of other sites, Timna, Lachish, uh, Safi eventually, and Beit Shemesh. In other words, we had a group of Judean sites, and we had a group of Philistine sites that gave us a regional approach to whatever we found at Ekron. There were other reasons why we chose the site. Here you see a, an aerial view of the site before we really got going, and you'll see it's very flat on top. So there were three basic reasons why we, we chose this site. First of all, there was no overlay. In our survey, we found immediately that there was no uh, Byzantine, no late Roman, no early Roman, no Hellenistic, no Persian overlays that if, like other sites, like Gezer and other sites, if we had started to excavate, we would have had to spend several million dollars in 20 years excavating very carefully material that didn't bring us to the site to begin with. Uh, the, 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 what we saw in our survey immediately was that the, the latest ex, uh, occupation of the site was in the seventh century. We could tell that from the sherds in our survey. So we could immediately not have to go through all those layers that didn't exist. We could immediately start with the period of the, the, the light, late Philistine period that brought us to this site. Another good reason is that if you look very carefully what the arrow is pointing, you'll see little white dots. And in our survey, we saw immediately that we could, uh, we could see the architectural plan of many parts of the site still very, very evident in, from the survey, which meant that we could start off not only excavating in the period we wanted to excavate, but we would have good architectural remains. And of course, another reason was that this site had never been excavated before. Many of you who are in the field who know the problem of chasing previous excavators like McAllister and other British and American archaeologists, you have to spend half your career at a site digging up the old digging up parts. And this was a pristine site. And all of these reasons put together brought us to uh, the excavations at Tel Mikna. Now, let's go back and see why the mistake was made, why archaeologists and historians thought that the Philistines really only occupied the Philistine uh, coastal plain in these major cities for about 200 years, and that around 1000 BCE, as I said before, they just were either occupied by another group or they were assimilated into one of the other major ethnic groups, the Phoenicians, the Israelites, uh, etc., et or the Canaanites. Well, one of the reasons was that after 1200, or pardon me, after 1000 BCE, what had been identified during those early 200 years as Philistine material culture tended to disappear. This beautiful Mycenaean 3C1B pottery, which we all love, no longer. Or the Philistine bichrome pottery, which followed, also disappeared. And of course, the architectural remains that were typical of the Aegean uh, West, this Megaron-type building with a, a large uh, entranceway and courtyard and a pillar center in this courtyard with a hearth, which you can see in the, in the blow-up. <clears throat> All of these which, talk, which give us the idea that these were Aegean affinities from the West, they no longer existed in any of these Philistine sites after 1000 BCE. And this is the reason why historians came up with this idea of about 1000 BCE, the Philistines had disappeared. 
Now, what was the real case when we excavated for our 14 seasons? We found, first of all, that the city was divided into two parts. There was an upper city and a lower city, which began well into the Middle Bronze period, somewhere in the second millennium. And then eventually, the lower city, which is now in black, was destroyed and abandoned, and only the upper city was, was there. So we have a long picture, a long history of this site, which eventually came under the rule of the Philistines around 1200 BCE, when they destroyed the upper city, and here are some of the remains of the destruction. And the Philistines, we know from the Medina Chabu um, um, scenes, uh, were the, the people that we expected that to have destroyed, destroyed this city. And they then resettled the upper city and the lower city uh, around uh, 1200 BCE. And then around 1000 BC, when they were supposed to disappear, they lost control of the lower city, which was destroyed. The upper city was only occupied from about 1000 to about 800 BCE. And then finally, in the seventh century, the Philistine city grew once again to include the upper and lower city. What we have here in these very simple colored top plants is an outline of the history of the city and an outline of Philistine existence from 1200 to about 600 BCE, just before the destruction in Jerusalem of the first uh, uh, Jewish temple. Now, you can see what we did here on this chronological chart. We document, documented under Ekron this, another, this additional 400 years, and then eventually other sites that had been excavated or were in the process of being excavated, they also came along to fill in. So we really led a whole group of other sites, and we've helped to establish a very secure historical period for the Philistines that lasts over 600 years. Now, all of this is very nice. I mean, <clears throat> it's good theory, and I assume that you believe what I've said, but I have to show you some of the proof, some of the excavations that will demonstrate uh, what I've said. Here is a top plan of Talmikna Ekron, the, the last day that we had excavated. And you can see here how we've divided the tell. This is field one, it's in the northeast Acropolis. And then in the lower city, we have a field two and field three. Uh, this is part of the industrial area, which I'll show you in a few moments. And then in the center of the city, there is field four, the elite area. These are all of the fields, the main fields that we excavated, and we're gonna go through them very quickly, and I wanna show you what we found to help demonstrate the ideas that I just presented to you about the existence of the Philistines. Here is an isometric drawing of the upper city. And the arrow is pointing to the very high point. And without knowing anything about archeology, span you can look at the legend and you'll see that the legend says that there was continuity of occupation all the way from the early part before the Philistines came in the 14th and 13th century. And then from the 12th, through the seventh century, there was continuity of occupation. And this is shown very easily when you see a section, uh, like you cut a cake, you know, tells are built with layer upon layer. And when you cut the cake, when you cut the tell, you'll be able to see stratified levels. And if you look below, you'll see here is the proof for continuity from stratum eight, from stratum seven and, uh, through four, all of these Philistine levels, Stratum 3, Stratum 2B, Stratum 2A, very exciting, Stratum 1C and 1B. So here in our layer cake stratigraphy, I can show that there was indeed continuity. The Philistines did not disappear as many uh, historians and archeologists thought. Now let's go back to the isometric and let's look at the very bottom of this section that we cut. And you'll see a very large mud brick tower, about 15 meters uh, in width. This is the lower part of the, of the tell, and it had to do with the fortification system. But the reason why I'm showing it to you is the next photo. Here you see, and we reached the water level. In fact, it's, a, it's an interesting site. Ekron is an inland site, as you know. But when we reached the water table, we had to do some underwater archaeology. We had to bring in a pump to pipe up the water all the time so we could dig here. But if you look very carefully at the stone facing of this mud brick tower, you will see something interesting. You will see Phoenician type architectural design and construction. You'll see header stones and you'll see 
uh, stretcher. You'll see two different types of uh, stone fronting, which really is Phoenician in type. And this is one of the first indications of the impact of other cultures, in, the, in, this, in this particular case of technology, on the Philistines. It begins the process of acculturation. And we'll see over and over again how the Philistines adapted to the impact of other cultures that they had to, to live with. We look through the other parts of this tell, and we find indications of other uh, cultures and their impact. Here we have a, a, what we call a lamellic store jar handle. I'm sure all of you can read that, but it, there's some English letters below. It says, lamellic Hebron to the king of Hebron. Very, very typical of, of the 8th century uh, Judean uh, uh, storage uh, handles. And then one of the other pictures at the very end of the sequence in the 7th century, here we see a young lady um, excavating a room with all kinds of storage jars. And when the storage jars are uh, uh, put together, you'll see all different types here. This is just uh, one room in a very large building. And if you look very carefully, I don't have the pointer here, but um, on the left-hand side, you'll see Phoenician jars. In the middle, you'll see uh, Judean-type jars. Here is a wonderful example of various aspects of the process of acculturation where all kinds of goods are coming from Phoenicia and from Judah to this Philistine site. So there's a great deal of contact between these two cultures. Now, the best part of my evidence is in what I call the lower city. This is where the industrial area is. This is where the elite area is. And if you look at this isometric, you will see that here we have the fortification wall. We have an entranceway with a three entryway gate. Then we have a street separating the northern and southern section. And if you look very carefully, you'll see in that street a sewer. Archaeologists are really garbage collectors. There's nothing better than finding a sewer with bones and all kinds of indications of what people ate and how they lived. And this uh, sewer separates, as I said, two different parts of the olive oil industrial plant. And this is a room that we're going to be looking at because Ekron produced the largest olive oil production center ever excavated in any period in antiquity. And I'll tell you more about that uh, in a minute. And this is one of the reasons why at the very end of Philistine existence, the city developed into this large industrial complex. And this is what happened to the Sea Peoples who came as immigrants uh, from the West in the 12th century. By the 7th century, they had developed into a very important uh, industrialists. Now, why did this happen? It didn't necessarily happen because the Philistines suddenly decided to produce olive oil. It really happened because they were affected by another culture, the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the, the, the bad nation, so to speak, of the end of the Iron Age, of the end of the, the first temple of the biblical period. And here we see in the yellow, you'll see the first indication, the first textual indication of the existence of Ekron outside the Bible. And this relief indicates uh, the Assyrian soldiers attacking the city of Ekron. It's, we don't have to guess what's going on because there's a caption. And this comes from the palace of Sargon II, the Assyrian king. And it gives us some idea of what's happening. Sargon uh, conquered uh, Ekron, and as a result, Ekron became a vassal city-state of the Assyrian Empire. And as such, it grew into this large industrial uh, complex. Now, in order to really understand what was going on in the 7th century, we need some basic history points. Here you see the outline of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And this is really the first classic empire in history. We talk about the Egyptian empire, it was not an empire. We talk about the Hittite empire, it was not an empire. What made this an empire was three elements in the structure of this uh, Neo-Assyrian empire. Namely, the Assyrians created a bureaucracy that allowed them to govern from the capital cities in Nineveh to all of the cities that they controlled on the periphery along the uh, eastern uh, Mediterranean basin or in the, in the Levant. They also developed a language which allowed them to communicate. Some of you will know uh, the word cuneiform. This was um, a, an alf not an alphabet, but a language with 800 characters and very difficult to uh, communicate over long distances, although they did for many centuries. But in the 7th century, 
the Assyrians adopted the Aramaic language, which became the lingua franca of the Old World, with, like in Hebrew and Aramaic uh, that we know today, has 22 basic characters. And this allowed them to more easily communicate with their provinces in uh, the West. And the third thing that made this an empire was that they developed a fiscal system which allowed them to make payments, uh, charge for mortgages, sell goods over long distances. They began to use silver as a kind of money. Now, silver had been used in antiquity beginning way back in the third millennium BCE, but never as it was in this particular period in the seventh century. And it really built up a kind of fiscal system which made the empire function. These three elements, if you try to look at what happened later with the Persian Empire, uh, the Hellenistic Roman, and as recent as the British Empire, you will find these three aspects which, which create a structure are the main elements that you, one can use to define what an empire really is. Not just you go in and you conquer and you take uh, hostages or you destroy cities and you take the gold and you bring it back. This is what made Assyria uh, the first classical empire. Now, this empire spread from originally from Assyria into uh, the Levant, into Anatolia, Turkey, and eventually uh, into Egypt. And this was part of the process that affected Ekron, as we'll see in a moment. Now, in order to understand the full impact, we have to step back a little bit, and we take a look at something that I call a project of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, center, periphery, and extended periphery. It's something that we developed out of the Ekron project. And as you can see, the periphery is where the capital cities were, pardon me, the center, and then the periphery was a little bit to the west, which included all of this territory. And then the Assyrians, who were not sailors, uh, developed a relationship with the Phoenicians. We know about Hiram from Tyre, from the Bible, and these Phoenicians became the surrogate travelers and merchants uh, of the Assyrians, and they went west. By going west and crossing the Mediterranean, they went to develop some colonies, but basically they were looking for goods, luxury goods and raw materials to bring back into the Assyrian uh, domain. And this is what happened all across uh, the Mediterranean basin. And in this project, we tried to find out what role Ekron, what role the Philistines had in this kind of process. Now, one of the ways of doing this is to try and to trace how certain elements of material culture, which were Philistine, which came from sites like Ekron, did they show up in the Mediterranean basin? And we have people testing the, the, the fabric of pottery, of store jars, across part of the, the North African uh, coastline, and we have people doing the same thing uh, in Spain. Unfortunately, because of the Arab Spring, many of our researchers couldn't go into to Carthage, I was at Carthage about nine years ago and developed a, a relationship with the people there, and we then sent other people to do the testing. But right now, that project is a bit on hold. But we will be able to see how certain elements of Philistine and Ekron uh, material culture went west. We also have another project within this, this larger project that deals with provenience. We want to find out the origin of where the silver comes from that we use in the transactions with the Assyrians. We found six silver caches, which I'll show you in a moment, at Ekron. And so we're using neutron activation analysis and other kinds of analysis, lead isotope analysis, I should say, to look for the provenience of some of the silver. Some of it, we are told, comes from the west, from Sardinia. Some comes from uh, Avignon in, uh, in Greece. And this is all part of the project of trying to build up an economic profile of how the Assyrian, how the Ekronites related to other elements in the Assyrian Empire. And by this, we look at the impact of this empire and the Phoenicians in particular on the culture, material culture, and the life of the Philistines. Now, in our area, the Levant, and you'll see most of you who know the, these words from, from the Bible, like Edom and the Edomites and Ammon, the Ammonites, and Phoenicia, we'll know that this is basically um, a map of Israel, Jordan, uh, and um, Lebanon. 
And the impact of the Assyrian Empire on this part of the world can be seen in Phoenicia because these cities of Phoenicia became the great trading centers for the Assyrians moving west. And the areas what we know of Ephraim and the Galilee in the northern part of Israel today, these areas were decimated because the, uh, the Assyrians didn't see any real use for these areas and much of the population moved elsewhere. The Assyrian effect on Edom was very important because of the incense trade coming from the south and moving north towards Damascus and off to Baghdad and other places, Nineveh. Uh, and so all these little sites became important fortresses on the road uh, for bringing incense north. And as far as Philistia became, it became a very important part of the Assyrian plan because much of what we see in the Shvela of Judah was destroyed, captured by the Assyrians in the destructions of the 8th century, uh, and many of the cities were given to Philistine cities. And this is how Ashkelon and Ekron especially grew in the 7th century. Now, as a result, we have here a very simple display of the effect of the Assyrian Empire on Ekron and all of this background that I've given you. If you look at the yellow, and in the yellow you will see these little stone kind of like uh, vats, and they represent, with the numbers, the number of olive oil installations. So there was a cottage industry in the yellow period, in the period before the Assyrians conquered Judah. So at Gezer there were seven olive oil uh, installations. At Beit Shemesh there were 12, and at Tel Beit Mirsim there were six. Whatever that means, there wasn't very much going on. People were producing olive oil for the local inhabitants. Now the Assyrians come, they destroy all of the yellow, and you can see here a picture of Albright himself excavating one of these vats at Tel Beit Mirsim. But as a result of the Assyrian invasions at the end of the 8th century, all of the college in, uh, industry, cottage industry was destroyed, and all of a sudden Ekron became the center for olive oil production. You can see one of the little pictures, the offsets here of an olive oil installation. This was the major effect on the Philistines in the seventh century at Ekron because it became a, uh, an Assyrian vassal uh, state and it obtained uh, preferred status under the Assyrian uh, control of the area because it picked up all of the hinterland in the immediate area of Judah. Now, let's take a look at this top plan to see how all of this picture fits together and how we can build an image of this process of continuity, an attempt by the Philistines to hold on to some of the culture that they brought from the, from the West, and <clears throat> what was the result of the impact of other cultures uh, on the Philistines in this process of acculturation. So here we see the, the top land, the orange, the various zones of occupation. The orange represents the, the zone of fortification with the walls and uh, with gates, etc. The green is the olive oil industrial area, and the blue, which where it says lower city, is the domestic. And in the center, uh, we see here the elite zone, this, this, this red period. Now, let's take a look at where these olive oil industrial installations were found. Each red dot represents one such installation, and with only 4.5% of the site excavated, we found 115 installations, which is an, an, a, a great number, as I said before, the, ma the major olive oil production center uh, in antiquity. Now, if you look where the arrow is pointing, you see little black dots. Each one of those black dots represents an olive oil installation, and you can see this was our field too. We barely had to excavate here. All we had to do was kind of brush away the topsoil and we came across all these olive oil installations. This is one of the reasons I mentioned at the beginning that brought us to this tell. Very easy excavation, not like what's going on at Gezer and other sites that they have to work so hard. <laughs> here you can see the topsoil and here's one of the installations. You see the, the basin in the center and then these two vats uh, on either uh, side, and this is the basic element in this uh, olive oil installation, but this is ba basically right on the surface of the tell. Now, the main area that we excavated, and I showed you an isometric of this, of field three, which has one of the main industrial center complexes in the site. Here we see 
the fortification, the three entryway gates, and the street with a wonderful sewer that separates the northern and southern section. Now, if we look at just one of these buildings, this one here, we'll see, if you look very carefully at the top of the slide, that's the surface of the tell. So here we came down maybe 15 centimeters, scraped a little, brushed off, and here you can see the massive destruction that put this uh, installation, the center of this industrial building, out of, out of order. And here you begin to see some of the, the installations appearing uh, themselves. Now, this is one room. This is one olive oil industrial uh, plant. And if you look again, we have the basin and separated with two vats, one on either side. And we have these stone weights that were used in the process of, of, uh, in the process of making olive oil. And if you see, look very carefully, you'll see those black spots. This whole area was destroyed. And the wooden beams that were used in the olive oil pressing uh, were totally burnt, except for this, this little ash that we found as the, the remains. Now, this is the reconstruction. And here you see, again, the basin. A stone roller was put in, and the olives were crushed, creating the first oil. Then the pulp was put into these straw baskets, one piled on top of the other. The wooden beam, which no longer exists, was then pressed down. And at the very end of the wooden beam, you see these uh, stone weights, these perforated stone weights. The one thing we learned about this, besides the capacity of each one of these installations, was that the Philistines were a very strong people. Because when we went to replicate this particular installation in three different parts of different museums, as well as at the kibbutz that we were working at, we couldn't lift up the stones because they were just too heavy. They were 125, 150 kilos. So we had to go down the, to the corner of, of the tzomet uh, where we were working, uh, the, the juncture where there was a gas station, and we got one of these hydraulic pumps and we brought it back to the site, and we pumped it up so we could lift up the stones, and finally we were able to attach them to the wooden beam, and then we pressed our oil. So the Philistines were quite strong in that, in that respect. Now, once the oil was, so, so to speak, pressed, what, and the remains were put in these store jars. Now, here you just see one of the rooms in these uh, olive oil plants, these factories. Each one had, oh, I think three rooms. Each room produced about 144 restorable vessels. This is just a small selection. And so after excavating uh, maybe seven or eight of these, we had to stop because we had no place to put the remains once we repaired and we restored all these, these vessels. And they were, it was a very repetitive process. Here you can see uh, some Judean-type vessels and some coastal types, and you'll see also um, other kinds of vessels besides the ones in these offset pictures. We then counted all of these vessels because we wanted to find out how they related to the architecture, what kind of assemblage we had. We ended up with 42,722 vessels, one of the largest assemblages ever put together uh, in any period. I must admit it took us 17 years to count uh, all of this material, but we now have it all in a wonderful database and we're using it in our field reports. And so this was very important because 83.5% of these vessels were Philistine coastal plain vessels. Many of them had developed out of the earlier Iron I period of the 12th and 11th century. And this gave us an indication in terms of the ceramic profile of continuity. And then we saw that uh, the rest, 7.5%, 8%, uh, some of it was Judean, some of it was Phoenician, some Assyrian. This gave us an idea of what kind of impact represented in the material culture, basically in the pottery assemblage, came to be because of contact uh, with other neighboring cultures and some of the superpowers uh, of the period. If you look very carefully, you'll see in the center of this green, uh, these are uh, agricultural tools. Gave us a wonderful example of metal that was used at the site with plow heads. And if you look just a little bit above it, you'll see a four-horned altar. This is very important because we want to try to understand not only the economy of the Philistines and how sophisticated it was, because the technology that we saw in the previous slides wasn't Philistine, it was Judean. There were no examples of olive oil installations prior to this period at Ekron. 
But there was, of course, as I showed you earlier, such technology in Judah by the Israelites. And so when all the Israelites' sites were destroyed at the end of the, of the 8th century and the 7th century developed this olive oil industry at Ekron, the technology used was Judean. It's another example of the process of acculturation, and this was a technological uh, process. If you look at the altar again, you'll see that this is a four-horned altar that many of you will remember from the book of Exodus, where the altar is, uh, there is a four-horned incense altar in the Temple of Solomon. And before that in the Bible, in the Mishkan, in the, in the tabernacle, such a four-horned incense altar also exists. What is it doing at a Philistine site in the seventh century when such altars no longer exist either in Israel, which has kind of disappeared with the ten tribes, or in, in Judah with the remaining two tribes? This is something that was probably picked up after the Assyrian invasions in, in the north, in Israel, and in Judah in the south, and the Philistines adapted, and they took over this incense altar, and it became part of their cultic practice. Another example of this tension between continuity uh, and the process of acculturation. Now here you see a rendering of what we thought the olive oil industrial plants behind the city wall in the industrial zone looked like. As you come in through the city gate and you make a right-hand turn, you see all of these elements in the complex. You'll see the olives being brought in from the fields in these, uh, in these uh, straw baskets. You'll see the presses that we just talked about a moment ago. And you'll also see some loom weights. The olive oil industry only could function two or three months a year, October, November, December. And that, mean, that means that at least nine other months during the year, this tremendous investment in material goods, in architecture and technology had to be turned over to something else. So we posit there was a second industry based on what we found in terms of loom weights, uh, a, a, a textual industry that probably went on during the other uh, years. Of course, olive oil was just as important to the Crusaders in this, in this period and in the seventh century as petroleum is uh, today. I just couldn't resist this cartoon for the New Yorker. <laughs> so let's take a look again now at the other zones of occupation. We've looked at the industrial zone. We're now going to look at the red zone. By the way, I should say that in the industrial zone, we had a very good excavator with us for many, many years, Dale Manor, who was sitting here. And in the uh, northeast Acropolis, where I showed you that first isometric of continuity, we also had a very good area supervisor. He's somewhere here, uh, Gary Arbino. And in this lower section, as I'll show you in a moment, in the red area, um, the major elite part of the elite zone was under the field archaeologist of uh, Steve Ortiz, who is also here with us. So we, we have a lot of old friends uh, with us today. Now we're going to look at two parts of the elite zone. The first part where the arrow is pointing is the temple auxiliary building. And the other part is the temple complex. We call it Temple Complex uh, 650. The we'll talk about architecture, but I'll just mention that this is typical of the temple auxiliary buildings. We find no indication here of any kind of Judean architecture. It's basically coastal. And in these rooms, we found some very interesting material that helps us to define the area as the elite zone. We found some of the, the best kinds of imitations of Assyrian pottery in the lower right-hand corner. We found uh, some of the best uh, four-horn incense altars. It was quality goods, which gave us the feeling that we were in a special quality or elite zone. We also had two other fascinating care categories of um, material culture. Here we see a, a young woman excavating a, a pot with some black garbagey kinds of things inside. And uh, when we opened it up, it looked like uh, some kind of lead whites, but we knew better once the material was clean. This is one of our silver caches. And here you find little pieces of silver. And you'll see that in antiquity, as I said before, as we look at more of the silver, that they just measured out little pieces of silver, and each, the, some of the small pieces would represent two pennies, three pennies, and some of the larger pieces, five dollars, whatever the weights would indicate, and this is how payment was made. In a, uh, a second cache in this period, you can see barely, if you look very carefully, some cloth sticking to some of the elements. This was in a cloth bag that fell on the floor of one of the destroyed rooms. 
And when we cleaned it up, we found this kind of material. Uh, the first one on the top is a silver ingot. Here we see a piece of silver with a cut mark in the middle, which we call hock silver, to hock a piece off. And then we find all kinds of pieces of jewelry no longer used as jewelry because the pieces are broken and really only had a value in terms of their silver uh, content. Now we also had a very important second category of evidence, and that is writing. Here we see one, two, three, four. These four pieces or examples of script found in this particular part of, of the building. Now the first one, I know you can read all of this, but perhaps people in the back can't see it as well, so I'll, I'll read it for you. It says, Kodesh, which is uh, the word holy, sanctified. This was found on one side of a very large store jar, and on the other side, we found the word La'asherat, to the goddess Asherat, the first indication of a god or goddess being worshipped uh, at the site. And those of you who remember something from the Bible will know that Asherah is one of the, the bad things that the Judeans and Israelites were not supposed to worship because it was uh, the, the symbol or the sign was a pole, a wooden pole. It was a very pagan kind of worship. And if you look very carefully at that, those of you who read the Hebrew, you'll see that this is not Hebrew, although the letters are what we would call Old Hebrew. It's really Phoenician because the Hebrew would end with the sound Comets hey ah or ah. Here it ends in the Phoenician at. Another indication of the Phoenician influence, not only on cult or religion, but actually on the writing uh, itself. This is a very important inscription, and we found four other uh, such inscriptions uh, at other places in the Tell. Now, another inscription which is really very important says Lemakom on the right-hand side where the number three is, and that means for the sanctuary. And then on the other side of the store jar, we found an X with three lines below it, three horizontal lines. And the X probably indicates truma, which you know from the Bible, is food set aside for the priesthood, sometimes in a 10% um, economy. And then underneath, there are three lines in the Phoenician counting system, 10, 20, and 30. So 30 units were set aside for the priests for the temple. Very, very important because it began to give us an idea that there must be a temple somewhere on the site. It must indicate a centralized religious system where people brought things to one place to sacrifice, to give to the priesthood. If we had a priesthood, we had a very well-developed cultic practice. Now if we think back, I didn't mention this before, but I showed you a couple four-horned altars. We had 17 four-horned altars found all over the tell, which means whatever the altars were being used for, whatever you did, you could do that almost anywhere on the tell. You could do it in the fortification system, you could do it in the olive oil industry center, you could do it in the elite zone, representing a decentralized system of religious practice. You could do it anywhere. You could do it in the synagogue, you could do it in the church, you could do it at home. But here we have an indication of a dual system, a centralized system where there is a temple somewhere. So all of these indications were very important. We had many, many other inscriptions like this. We had 27 altogether besides the major inscriptions. And this was, this was a nice inscription to find because we knew that we were dealing with olive oil storage jars, but here the word shemen appears on one of the jars, which means uh, oil. So we had kind of confirmation of that as well. Now we're moving from the temple auxiliary building into the temple complex itself. And Steve Ortiz was the field archaeologist for this very uh, important part of our excavation. And Steve, it will be published soon. I guarantee it. If this was the largest building of its kind ever excavated uh, in Israel, and in this rendering, this kind, this uh, isometric, I should say, we see two foreign elements. Again, helping us to understand what factors played into the process of acculturation. We see a large building. On the right, we see a courtyard. Uh, and then we see a throne room in the middle, separating the sanctuary and the courtyard. This really represents some aspects of an Assyrian 
design concept. It's not a, a duplicate of a, an Assyrian building found in the provinces or back in Assyria, but it has certain elements that are not found in any other kinds of buildings excavated in Israel. So we have the Assyrian design uh, influence, and if you look at the, on the right-hand side, you'll see all these little white pillars. This represents a kind of Judean construction. And if you look on the left, where it says sanctuary, this is terribly important because this is a Phoenician sanctuary. Those of you who get to Cyprus one day and visit the site of Kittion will find a 7th century Phoenician temple with this kind of structure. So here we have the elements of Assyria, of Judah, and Phoenicia all into a Philistine 7th century cultic building. Now in this rendering, again, we have the courtyard, we have the throne room separating the two elements. This is the major aspect of a Syrian design concept. Then we have the sanctuary itself. Now, one of the side rooms also produced something very important. Here we see in the side room, you'll see part of an olive oil installation, the only one found outside of the olive oil industrial center. And since it relates to the sanctuary, we assume that olive oil must have been produced here for some kind of cultic use, anointment or something of that sort. Why this is terribly important, because in this room we had 253 storage jars, probably coming down from a third and second level as well. And on one of the storage jars, as you'll see on the right in the orange, we find the inscription, Le Baal ou le Padi. Those, those of you who know, who've read the Bible, will know that the, the, the pagan god who fought against Yahweh was always Baal, coming out of Phoenicia, coming out of a Ugaritic and a West Semitic tradition. And so here we see the, uh, the head of a pantheon. Baal was the head of the Canaanite pantheon. We already had Asherah, who was a very important uh, goddess, and we have two elements that we know from the, from the Old Testament, Baal and Asherah. And what this inscription says for Baal and for Padi, Padi we know from the Neo-Assyrian inscriptions, was the king of Amkaruna, Ekron. And what we think this is, is a calc, it's a copy of an Assyrian statement about the relationship of a citizen to the god and to country. What is, what is Caesar's is due unto Caesar, you give to Caesar. What is due unto Baal, you give to, the, to, to Baal. And what is due to the king, you give to the king. Very important inscription which has caused all kinds of controversy in its interpretation. But here we see Baal, and we know Baal was also mentioned in the Bible as a god at Ekron, Baal Zavu. We know that from, from Samuel. And what else was we found in this wonderful area? We found a complex of all kinds of artifacts which represent different cultures, a combination of uh, a figurine, a uh, a fertility goddess of some sorts with a kind of Phoenician Egyptianizing uh, a headdress. Uh, we also found this wonderful ivory piece of a princess in an Egyptian kind of motif. Uh, the largest uh, uh, ivory head ever excavated in Israel, which is the top of one of these big harps that we know from antiquity. And this wonderful piece, this 40 centimeter high ivory tusk. And if you look on the left, you will see the image of what's left of a male figure. And then if you look on the right, you'll see on the, this comes off the side of this ivory piece from a, an elephant tusk. You'll see a princess that we can now identify in a new publication as the queen. So who is the king? Well, we don't have to guess because on the right-hand side, we have the hieroglyphic, we have the cartouche of the Egyptian king Merneftah. Now, those of you who know something about Egyptian history will say this is in a 7th century destruction where Neftaf was a 13th century Egyptian king. There's quite a difference in the period. And we think that based on the booty texts of the Assyrian kings uh, who went into Egypt and raided these mortuary temples and sanctuaries and brought back these kinds of artifacts into the provinces and into the home country, we have an example of the kinds of materials that came from Egypt in the 7th century. And this is also now in the process of of publication. All of these artifacts are part of what we found in the side rooms of the sanctuary. This is the last example I'll show you. On the left is a small amulet, a Patach Patachus, the Egyptian god of craftsmen, and then on the right is a wonderful uh, golden uraeus, the kind of 
cobra you would see coming out of the headdress of an Egyptian pharaoh. So all of these represent different aspects of different cultures that somehow had been brought to this Philistine cultic center in the elite zone. The sanctuary itself also has all kinds of interesting cultural phenomena. We have this large um, entranceway here with uh, water uh, pits as you walk in to wash your hands, I suppose. And then we have these round column bases, which are not typical of Judean structure in the Iron Age, uh, but they are more typical of Aegean construction because they're round and not rectangular or square. Uh, and then we go to the Holy of Holies at the end of the sanctuary. And this is a, a fascinating uh, structure which Steve excavated. And here just as in the rendering, you'll see the entrance to the throne room, the water pits, the, uh, the round basins, and, and the other capital, uh, the sanctuary itself. And one of the stones that fell out of the wall of the sanctuary is also significant because as you can see in the center, we have the sign a very similar sign to that of the goddess, the Assyrian goddess Ishtar, in the temple itself. And in the sanctuary part, the very, the Holy of Holies, we found this uh, bronze spit and a very interesting figurine. Those of you who know something about cult practice in the Bible, uh, in an archaeology, will know that whenever you find figurines, people say, aha, we found a cultic part. But this is the only figurine, to my knowledge, that was ever found in the Levant in a sanctuary. We call it a sanctuary because of the architectural design which I showed you, and we also call it a sanctuary because we have an inscription that says it is a sanctuary. That's very good. <laughs> so this is a very, very important uh, figurine. It's Phoenician, by the way, and you find these kinds of figurines all up and down the Mediterranean. Another example of all kinds of cultural impact on the Philistines. Now, this was found the last two weeks of the excavation. We had been looking for monumental architecture. We had a major capital city of the Philistines, part of the Assyrian Empire in the seventh century. And the excavator of this area, every time he came to a large stone, he would say, come, we have a monumental inscription. Steve couldn't produce a monumental inscription. But in the last two weeks of the excavation, he brought me over to this stone, which all covered with destruction material, about a meter or so of destruction material from the Neo-Babylonian destruction of 604 BC. And he said, this is going to be, a I said, Steve, you've been telling me for years that this is going to be a monumental inscription. Clean it off, and if there's something, come back, I'll come back and look at it. 10 minutes later, he cleaned it off, and we had a wonderful monumental inscription. Here you can see some of the letters coming up. And there are some pots, if you look very carefully, that we hadn't excavated yet as part of the destruction level. Now, when the stone was cleaned, it had 72 letters, lines separating various rows. And there are little dots, if you see, between the letters. And except for one or two letters, it was very distinct. And after a couple of days of looking at it, with the help of Yosef Naveh, we were able to decipher the entire uh, inscription. Actually, we had done about two or three lines with Trudy and myself uh, before Navet came on the scene, and we had um, given a, a, an interview to the local radio, and it became a, the front page of the New York Times. It was a very important inscription, and we came up with uh, uh, two names of kings, and we published those names of kings. And then a lot of skeptics said, you cannot find an inscription with names that appear in the neo assyrian in the Neo-Syrian annals, it's just too pat. It has to be a forgery. Uh, we went through all of that kind of business, but eventually when we cleaned it off and we saw the inscription in its entirety, it was clearly uh, a legitimate find and it was well sealed in a destruction level. And it was a beautiful inscription, which perhaps demonstrates in the best possible way this problem of continuity and acculturation. It's the smoking gun excavated at Ekron with all kinds of evidence. If this is the only find we ever came across at this site, I had have been happy because it's got everything. Here you see a transcription, and we look at the first word, bat, which means the temple or the shrine, uh, ban or bana, which was built. I won't go through the whole inscription because it's a little complicated, but what we have here are two Phoenician-type words. We have a combination of Old Hebrew but mostly Phoenician. The letters 
could be either Phoenician uh, or Hebrew, but the words follow the Phoenician syntax and grammar, such as these two words. And uh, let's go on. So we have a temple built by Ikausu. In Hebrew, it would be Achish, and those of you who know your Bible will know that Achish was the king of God, a Philistine king of God. But the word here is Ikausu, uh, which means, uh, we know from the uh, cuneiform tablets of the Assyrian annals, uh, which means the Achaean, or more simply, the Greek. So here we have Ikausu, the son of Padi, who built a temple, etc., etc., and we have a complete dynasty. We have the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, and then we have at the very end of this dynasty, we have the words Sar or Sharu, which means the king or the ruler, and then that beautiful word Ayin Kufresh Nun Ekron. So it was nice digging there for 14 years, but now we had the evidence we were actually digging the site uh, of Ekron. We'll put it into an English translation for you, make it easier. The temple which he built Ikausu, the son of Padi. Of course, Padi we knew from before in another inscription as king of Ekron. The son of Yasa, the son of Adad, the son of Yar, ruler of Ekron, for Patgaya, his lady. So here we have another goddess. We already have Baal, who's the head of the pantheon. We have Asherah, who we know is a, a Canaanite and West Semitic goddess, a Phoenician goddess, um, and now a Philistine goddess worship. But the temple is not dedicated to either of those two gods or goddesses. It's dedicated to Patgaya, which is a, a composition of two words. Pitho or Patio in the 8th century, we know, is the other word for Delphi in Greece. And Gaia is the famous Mycenaean mother goddess. So here we have a, a, a king of, of Ekron who calls himself the Greek, building a temple to a Greek goddess, which represents a very interesting phenomenon and shows you another aspect of this process of acculturation. It either reflects the early movement or migration of the Philistines in the 12th century or probably reflects a greater relationship of the Levant, of especially of Philistia and Phoenician, uh, to the Greek world. This is the smoking gun. It has Ekron. It has all the aspects of Old Hebrew Phoenician, it has another goddess name. The formulas are Phoenician, etc. It's a perfect example of what happens in this process of acculturation after 600 years of occupation of this Philistine site of Ekron. Well, let's try to summarize very quickly and see what we've proved or haven't proved. This is a artist's rendering of what the site looked like. Uh, it could have supported several thousand people, but as an industrial center, we suppose that most of the people who worked here lived outside the fortress and came to work at the center. And the olives were produced in the low hills of the Shvela, in the neighboring Judah, and the workers would bring the, the baskets of, of, of olives through the gate and into the uh, olive oil production center, and he would drop off his olives, and they would make olive oil. Then he would go to the temple in the center of the city and say thanks to God. And after he finished his daily work and his prayers, he would go out the back gate of the city and catch the bus to Tel Aviv, which is only 45 kilometers away. <laughs> but the main elements which prove, again, I think this whole process of continuity is the typical uh, coastal architecture. No evidence of other kinds of Judean architecture that we find at other sites. We find typical uh, coastal type pottery, which I spoke about before. And then we have a weight system, a four shekel weight system. You know about the shekel from the Bible. And this was a Judean system that the Philistines adopted. And of course, the uh, four horned altars that we found, 17 of them. Here you see them right here, uh, all over the tell. A wonderful collection uh, of uh, an example of Philistine cultic practice adopted from the ancient, uh, from the Israelites and Judeans. We also found this wonderful silver medallion. On the left you'll see the, uh, the goddess Ishtar standing on a lion, a very common motif that we know from Zinjulay and other Assyrian provinces. And then the worshiper standing in front of Ishtar with his hands raised. And above him we see the Pleiades and the moon and the sun, all part of a very common Assyrian motif 
used here in a Philistine setting. We also found other elements. I've only mentioned this other one. It's an Egyptian sistrum, a Celtic musical instrument used in Egyptian uh, Celtic uh, practice. Well, the city ended. In 604 BCE, we actually know the month according to an inscription that relates to Ashkelon. We think it's in the month of December. It comes out to be like the 15th of December in the year 604 BCE. The Neo-Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Ashkelon. We think also Ekron. And the city was not, again, occupied in any major uh, way. There was some small settlement afterwards, but it, not terribly important. So. What happened to the Philistines after all this occupation and going through this dual process of struggling with continuity and acculturation? We know the city was Philistine in the seventh century because we have Assyrian texts that say the Assyrian army and the king came to an area called Philistia and they attacked cities that were Philistine cities and the people who lived in these cities uh, were called Philistines, using, of course, the Assyrian words for these, what we use in English. So we know that this was definitely a Philistine area. But what happened to them afterwards? And we gained some, some insight from this last slide that I'll show you. Here we have an inscription, an Aramaic inscription, called the King Adon inscription. And ironically, some of you will remember that in 1942, in September of 1942, the, uh, the German army was approaching from the west, was approaching Alexandria and, uh, with Rommel, and they were about to take the city. Right at that time, this inscription was found by some Egyptian archaeologists. And the inscription said, uh, this is a, a letter from what turned out to be the last king of Ekron. His name was Adon, to his uh, patroon. At that time, Egypt was very important in this part of the world. The Assyrians had retreated. And he said, look, the Babylonians have come as close as far as uh, Afek. It's only a day's uh, walk from, uh, from Ekron. And if you don't send us some troops, uh, we're going to lose out. The Babylonians will take the city. And of course, like in the reference in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah said, give in to uh, the Babylonians do not depend on the Egyptians. They're not going to save you. The Egyptians did not save the Philistines. They did not save Ekron either, and the city was destroyed. Now, in excavating the city, we never found any bodies. There were no skeletons, which means that the people must have left the city before the Babylonians came and destroyed it. Where they went, well, we know from Babylonian texts that much of the f occupation of Philistia was taken into captivity back to Babylon. So what happened to the Philistines? Well, we know about 40-odd years later, the king of Babylon is in a complaining mood. He writes, you know, I still have to feed these people I took into captivity, the sons of Aga. Aga was the last king of the Philistine city of Ashkelon. And then another century plus later on in the uh, uh, suburbs of Nippur, which is a major city in, in Babylon, that this, uh, this company that does business with stocks and bonds and mortgages was complaining about the, the relationship it had in what we call the Marashu archives uh, of this company named Marashu, that they had to deal with um, two groups of people living in, in two different areas. One area was called Hazan or Gaza, uh, which was a very famous Philistine capital city that was destroyed. And people, I think, were taken into captivity. And the other city was called Ishkalunu, or Ashkelon. And these are the last two real references that have any meaning for the existence of the Philistines. And so what we see is, in this process, that by the seventh century, when the uh, Ekron became this large international industrial center, it was impacted by so many different cultures that when the Babylonians came in 604, destroyed the city, and uprooted the people from their home country and took them into captivity, they no longer had a core culture sufficient enough to sustain them in captivity. And so at that point, the Philistines did disappear from the pages of history. Thank you. This evening, 
you've been treated uh, to what I consider to be some of the best of what archaeology has to contribute to a better understanding and enriched understanding of the Bible. And uh, in this case, particularly about one of the people groups, the Philistines, who were close uh, neighbors, in many ways cousins, uh, who were immersed and, and integrated into Israelite society, but in many ways, in, a, in an invisible way, when we think about it from the uh, perspective of the biblical text. As Sai said near the beginning of his talk, uh, the picture we have of the Philistines, if we were to rely exclusively on the Bible, presents a rather narrow perspective, and it's often a negative one, not because of any kind of inaccuracy as such, so much as because of the perspective of the authors who were uh, communicating other primarily theological uh, truths and, 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 and points. But archaeology gives us much broader perspective, and um, often inadvertent, uh, the little artifacts that you find uh, on an excavation, fragments of whether it be pottery, or even more uh, dramatic discoveries like uh, figure, uh, figurines or inscriptions, but still fragments of information that together in a kind of large mosaic, a large uh, puzzle, as archaeologists begin to piece it together, begin to give us a profoundly enriched, a nuanced or textured uh, picture of uh, these ancient peoples who have disappeared uh, from historical memory in many ways uh, for the various reasons, including those that you heard uh, so I described this evening. So this is one of the things that I think is really significant. It may easily be lost, the significance of that, uh, in, in listening to some of the detail of uh, the kind of presentation that we heard this evening. But it represents the, really the best of what archaeology can contribute. And in my view, I think it profoundly enriches our understanding of the biblical world. The other thing I wanted to say this evening as a comment is from a more professional perspective, uh, from the archaeological perspective. And Tel Mikne and the excavations that Sai and Trudy Dotan and their team have, have conducted represent some of the best of archaeology. And uh, you may not realize that listening to um, the kind of the finished product of what you heard in his presentation this evening. But archaeology as a field exercise, as an enterprise, is a vast undertaking that takes decades. In fact, uh, the, uh, the Tel Mikne excavation has been going on for uh, more than two decades, I think, in, in terms of the, the primary field a component of it, uh, involving dozens, if not hundreds, of people. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, the logistics are, uh, can be a nightmare as a director of an excavation. There's a tremendous undertaking that came into trying to pull together all this vast bit of information. And it's really important to keep in mind that as you excavate, you're not just excavating bits and pieces of information, but ultimately those will lead to an interpretation. And so the quality of how you excavate becomes very, very important. And it also has to do with what we in archaeology tend to just sort of loosely or, or flippantly refer to as the only science or discipline that shoots its informers or that destroys its evidence as it proceeds. So there's a very, very important aspect of documentation that a good excavation needs to be sure to do. And the Tel Mikne excavations in many ways are an exemplar of this, both in their field techniques, their recording systems, and their publication record, something that we as archaeologists aren't always, uh, have, don't always have as good a record as we'd like to um, claim, and that is publishing, presenting our information to the public in a way that is both timely, prompt, and accessible. And the Tel Mikne excavations have done that. As, a, as, a, as an example of, of the rigor, a personal touch, I don't, I'm sure so I won't remember this, but when I was a teenage college student, and was on a tour to their site. This was early on in the, in the goings of uh, excavating material about the Philistines, and I was all excited. We were getting to see this great uh, project, and I came running up to him, and I asked him, and they, they have this pottery. We saw a slide of some of the so-called Mycenaean 3C pottery or Philistine monochrome, Philistine bichrome pottery, and I asked him, well, do you have like, any shirts that you throw away? Because I wanted to have a piece that I could take home so that I could say, well, this is a piece of Philistine pottery. And so I said, well, we keep everything, sorry. And I'll never forget that, but it was, it was, a, it was a personal uh, moment for me, but it was also indicative of the kind of, of rigor that they apply to their field technique. Not only do they systematically collect everything, but they kept it as part of that documentation process, but also so that others could go back and work through that material independently, perhaps, in uh, future uh, generations of scholarship. Because the interpretive process means that you're invariably going to have competing, contested, differing views of interpretation. And that is, in the fact, now the case where we are in the field of uh, the study of the Philistines and other Iron Age cultures. There is now a vigorous, lively debate about various aspects of its history, 
of its culture and its impact. And good excavation projects like the one we've heard about this evening not only give us the great results and those uh, and insights that we get and as they relate to the biblical world, but they also will mean that for next generations of scholars there will be an opportunity for people to go back, revisit as our knowledge improves, uh, and to revisit some of the interpretations that have been made and to um, potentially come up with not only better understandings but also perhaps <coughs> correct interpretations that have been made in previous uh, generations. So one of the things that we should have come out of, uh, hopefully, what you heard this evening, is that the Philistines were not this kind of backward uh, culture. That the, there's a whole new meaning to the term being a Philistine that really doesn't apply in many ways uh, to the way we often associate it with us uh, in our own sort of cultural um, imagery in, uh, today. The Philistines were a very sophisticated culture. They um, employed uh, the best technologies. They were good adapters. They brought in existing technologies and found ways to improve it. They also integrated into the local cultures. They assimilated, they borrowed, um, and in many ways subtly turned uh, some of those various aspects into a kind of composite culture that they made their own. And in so doing, we again learn not only a lot about the Philistine culture, but we also begin to uh, take that into the context of our understanding of the biblical world. The, the partners, the players, the neighbors, even the foes, the enemies that the uh, Philistines and the Israelites uh, encountered on a day-to-day -day basis. One uh, quick other quick comment that I'd like to bring in just to show you how important Ekron really became in this uh, late Iron Age context of the 8th and 7th centuries in particular was made uh, star more stark to me recently in our own excavation uh, project. We were excavating a, a, a temple actually from roughly the same time of uh, the late 8th and 7th centuries in a site to the north that I'm involved in and came down on, an, on a collection of uh, cuneiform tablets, one of which present, preserved part of a treaty, a succession treaty between the Assyrian king Esar Haddon and the local uh, official at, the, at our site. And, one of, and it has a long list of curses if you don't follow through with um, the agreement that the document lays out. And one of the curses has a reference to Ekron. And it, in fact, was the, uh, the, the reference that uh, was laid out in the monumental inscription that you just saw a few minutes ago. So this is a very, very new discovery, really exciting for us, but it brings out also how much I Ekron had become kind of iconic in the popular imagination of the day. This reference basically makes reference, we think, to the same uh, deity, the female deity that was referred to. Um, it makes reference to the lady or the queen or the patron uh, of Ekron, and it's a curse. And it says, may uh, Sharat Ekron make a worm fall from your sides if you do not uh, follow through with the agreement of this treaty. Uh, this is in the midst of hundreds of other curses, but it comes out with new meaning when you think about it in the context of the inscription that we just saw this evening, where she is uh, entreated to help give protection and, uh, to the local community that uh, worshipped in that temple complex at Ekron. So this is just one example. I could give many others, but the point here is that this is a very, very important site produce really an important part of the story of the time of Iron Age Israel and its neighbors, and archaeology can really profoundly enrich and even change our understanding of that biblical world, and I think in a way, and very much in a way that is positive um, and enhances our understanding of the biblical text. It was about 4 o'clock this afternoon, I was in the hotel pool playing shark with my kids. And one of the things they like doing is where I go under the water and I try to grab their feet and I eat on the shark. Well, because I spent time with my family, we were at the aquarium this uh, morning, this afternoon, I didn't make the scholars lunch. And because I didn't make the scholars lunch, I got their short straw and I found out that they decided that I was going to give the response to Sai. Um, there is a connection there between plain shark and the sharks that were at the scholarly lunch here. Uh, unlike my colleague Tim, I'm not going to come up here and throw a curse on Ekron or Sai. Uh, as uh, a, a student of Sai's and uh, working at Talmikni for several years, uh, I just have some uh, uh, condemnation. But uh, some things I want to talk about Tim, one of the uh, uh, Things that Tim pointed out with Sai is his careful uh, scholarship. And as a student working at the Albright, working at Talmikni, I can attest to this. When he said he measured every single store jar, he measured every single store jar. I remember, I, I, 
called them fights. Uh, Sy um, called them arguments of, of locus sheets where we're de defining what's the difference between circular and round. In Sai's mind, there is a difference, and he will show you with over 7,000 pots which ones are circular and which ones are round. Uh, we would argue what is a pebbly surface versus a gravelly surface. And in the locust sheet, he knew the definition, and he can point out on each of these surfaces which one is pebbly and which one is gravelly. Um, and because of that, when Sai gives a presentation, it is very thorough. You know that it's based on scholarship, years of scholarship, years of research, years of, of reasoning. But I did jot some things down that I would like to uh, comment. One of the things that's confusing is this picture of scholarship that Sai mentioned when he said that most scholars assume that after the uh, 1000 BC, we didn't know much about the Philistines. Well, in my generation, we don't view it that way. So apparently, Sai's having an argument with his generation, but that's because Ekron and Sai's research has had such an impact that he has already changed the field. So my generation has already incorporated the research of Ekron and the research of Sai and, and Trudy. And so Sai, that's uh, one point I want to make. The, the textbooks, what I'm teaching, it is all based on the research that's occurring at, at Ekron. So uh, feel free to change that in your presentation, Sai. You've already won the argument. Uh, uh, one thing that t Tim pointed out, when I'd come back from Israel, I'd go to Sunday school, um, they'd always ask me, well, well, what are you doing with the Bible? Are you proving the Bible? Are you looking at the Israelites? And I'd say, no, I'm studying the Philistines. I've been working on the Philistines. And there'd be this disappointment. I'd say, you don't understand. The Philistine research is the wave of biblical scholarship. It's what's going on in the Philistine coast that is helping us define what's going on with, up in the hill country with the, with the Israelites. And so that was a, always an irony for me, and going back to my Southern Baptist church saying, if you want to learn about the Bible in archaeology, study the Philistines. And as you saw in Sai's presentation, that was exemplified in what happened at Ekron, uh, in terms of the research, has influenced what biblical scholars are doing today. Um, a, a third thing I want to mention is this Neo-Assyrian project. Uh, Sai has been instrumental in pulling scholars from various religions, various groups, various political. Um, you can see in the Middle East how political it can get, but Sai has been instrumental in getting scholars to come to the table and talk about their research. And this has been very influential, this multidisciplinary approach, a multinational approach. And if you look at if you go to the ACER meetings, you go to SBL meetings, everybody that's doing this type of multidisciplinary research, uh, I would propose that it's based off of the work of Cy Gittin, not just at Tal Mickney, but also at the, at the Albright Institute. Um, there were some corrections I have to make with your presentation. He talked about seven olive oil installations at Gezer. This past summer, we found another one. And so we, he should change that to eight olive oil installations. <laughs> now, this brings me to another criticism. Gezer is just half an hour from Jerusalem. So I don't know, we always invite Sai to come down and look at the research going on at Gezer, but it's just so hard for him to come down the hill down to, I guess, to the Philistine coast. I'm sure there's some tension there. So when Mark told, told me that Sai was coming to Houston, I thought, I have to come see this miraculous event. We can't even get him to Gezer, <laughs> but he has him coming down to Houston. So naturally, I dragged my wife and kids to come see Sai in Texas, and uh, so uh, you all are part of a, of a miracle that happened here for uh, Mark. So Mark, uh, uh, it, it, a trial lawyer, was able to uh, move some mountains here. So, uh, but uh, I'm sure at breakfast tomorrow morning, I'll show you some of the slides and, and the evidence from Gezer. Uh, there, there is one criticism I have of Sai. Um, he is one of the leading scholars in ceramics and in the Iron Age. And when you have some of these deconstructionist trends, um, Sai's voice has been somewhat silent. And as a senior scholar, Sai should have jumped into that debate. Now, I know why he didn't jump in that debate, because of his character. Uh, Sai Gittin is not a man to criticize other scholars freely. And I've known that as a graduate student, as I'm asking him for advice, 
should I read this article? He would never criticize the scholarship. They'd say, oh, you might not, we might want to read this. And I'd have to read between the lines because I'd never see him criticize another scholar publicly, in private, and most people who have worked with Sai, and he's worked with a lot of people, have found that he is a man of character, uh, he's a man of ethics, and um, uh, as you can see in his work, that not just in his scholarship, but also in his personal, um, uh, in, in the person of Sai Gittin. So um, I want to commend him for that. And uh, that's about it. I just want to uh, clarify the story he told about the discovery of the Talmikne inscription. Um, Sai as a field director is also a bean counter. And back then, all the photographs were, you know, the, you know we'd have a photo lab and it was very expensive. And so I'd find a uh, work stone about the size of an inscription and I'd say, Sai, this is an inscription, it's gonna be an inscription. And so we'd get the photographer there, we'd get do the research, we'd take a hundred photographs of this, we'd flip it over and it'd be blank. All this keeps, kept happening until we came to the Ekron inscription. And I told Sai, this is it. I know this is gonna be the inscription. And by that time, Sai wasn't gonna invest any more money in my uh, wild juice uh, 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 chases of this uh, inscription here. And I remember that one uh, uh, afternoon, uh, it was sunlight, it was probably about four o'clock, and so the sun washes away anything you can see on the rock. And I told Sai and Trudy, this is it. I, I can tell there's an inscription here. And he said, no, that's just the, the nature of the limestone. Him and Trudy went back to the lab. Uh, I called the photographer who had strict orders not to take any photographs in my field because <laughs> of, uh, of the budget. Now, my wife worked down in the camp, and she tells me a story. Sai can come up and go, we're going to need 17 more rolls of toilet paper. We're, gonna, we're not going to make it this season. He had it down to a science. You get 10 students, it's gonna cost this much rolls of toilet paper, this much food. And so I knew, but I told the, the photographer, no, I know this is gonna be something. It's in this temple, uh, and by then we were calling it a palace. We weren't sure it was a temple. Um, and sure enough, he pulled out his, uh, his uh, a photo shield where he was able to, with the um, shadows, uh, cast a, a shadow over the inscription and we were able to see the words upside down. And so I, I, we had radios back then, there weren't cell phones, and so I radioed Sai and I said, this is it. And so I remember Sai saying, congratulations, I'll be there in half an hour, and the rest is history. And so I want to thank Dr. Giddon for allowing me to be part of that history. Thank you, Sai. Uh, I give a reply not as a, uh, uh, an archaeologist, I give a reply as a uh, just a fellow who loves to read the Bible and study and teach it and then look at things as a trial lawyer. So here's my response. Um, I do think there's a great tendency among those of us who at least go to church with me, and certainly as I grew up in church, there's a great tendency of us to think of the Philistines in terms of, of the bad guys. We think the story of Samson and Delilah and I listened to tonight, and, and I think, uh, of course, Samson was uh, enticed by the allure of this international sophisticated foreigner who probably had makeup as delightful as her bichromal pottery, which compared to the dismally bleh pottery of the Israelite women, no doubt uh, inflamed great passion and desire on behalf of Samson as he went chasing Delilah. Um, I'm reminded uh, 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 in that same sense, though, of the interactions between the two cultures, which the Bible story tells us was clearly there. It was clearly there not only for David to fight Goliath, but it was there for David to go live among the Philistines when he was on the outs with King Saul. So the, 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 the Bible's very clear in conveying this same acculturalization between the different uh, uh, groups. Uh, I, I also approach this appreciating the Bible in its historical sense as well. Um, if you go back, if, if you've been in our class as we've been studying through the Old Testament, you'll recall how during the Assyrian Empire's expansion, 
There were periods where Judah would try to entice its neighbors into joining it into an anti-Assyrian rebellion. One of those neighbors it would try to entice into helping it would be the Philistines as well the Phoenicians. I was thinking about Sai's slide that showed the trade coming from those coastal towns for the Neo-Assyrian Empire and how the Assyrians weren't the sailors. The sailors were the Phoenicians and to some degree, uh, 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 at least sailing from the ports of, of the Philistines. And it makes sense to me why the Assyrians would be so irate over the idea that these cultures might be in some type of rebellion when they relied upon these places for their trade, for their economy, and, and for the, the, the process of goods back and forth through that area. Last uh, point in this regard of the Bible is history. Even though there was a period where there were cynical scholars who thought the Philistines were gone by 1000 BC, the Bible, of course, said nothing of the sort. If you read Jeremiah, Jeremiah, while he's prophesying about the demise, the coming demise of Jerusalem and Judah, Jeremiah also prophesies in Jeremiah 25:20 that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians coming in to wipe out Jerusalem will also be wiping out the Philistines specifically calling them, quote, the kings of the land of the Philistines, including Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod. And Jeremiah not only got it squarely right, as per Jerusalem and Judah, but uh, not surprisingly nailed it also for the Philistines. Uh, 604 B.C., December 15th, beware the Ides of December, I guess. Um, Two other things of note, and then I'll read the questions, and I'll abdicate the uh, platform to Sai, and I'll read the questions from down there. First of all, did you have fun seeing all of the, the uh, um, ancient uh, 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 West Semitic script, those funny, goofy-looking letters that are dating from seven to 800? They're very, very, very similar to the script that we use to paint the Ten Commandments with up there. It's not your normal Hebrew script, which is actually Aramaic. That the square Hebrew letters that we're used to reading as Hebrew are Aramaic script that don't come around until later. So when we painted the Ten Commandments, knowing that the Hebrews would not have had the Aramaic script back then at the time of Moses, we used a much older script. So if you have a chance on the way out, uh, be sure and look at the Ten Commandments and think, my, that reminds me of size slides. Then I must also give one advertisement for class tomorrow if you're there. I had no idea that Sai would mention the Muirshu tablets tonight. Uh, those were the tablets. The Muirshu family was the equivalent of a banking family in, uh, uh, in Babylon. And those tablets are pretty safely dated at the time it was under Persian control. But in the mid-5th century B.C. And, and uh, the Muirshu tablets also reference the Jews that had stayed in Babylon, a number of Jews in commercial transactions. It's pretty cool because it gives you not only the Jews, but it tells you something about their names and how they were assimilating to some degree, some Babylonian and Persian names as well. That's a freebie enticement to tell you, come to class tomorrow, you can learn more. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. Do we know if the Philistine or how the Philistines were related to the Mycenaeans and or had the migrations of the sea people, was it related to the Trojan War? I think that's a good interrelated question because there are many theories of what the origin of the Philistines uh, was, but we, we, we do think that they came from the West for the most part and were the product of movements out of the Mycenaean Late Bronze period, the palace economies. And we even named their first period of their pottery Mycenaean 3C1 uh, B. So there was a relationship. And the destruction of, of Troy, uh, Troy 7A, also relates to the migration. The destruction of other cities in the Levant, like Ugarit, a very important destruction, also relates to the Sea Peoples. And in the inscription that I, that I showed, we have um, 
the goddess Patgaya. And Gaia is the mother goddess of the Mycenaean mother goddess. There's all kinds of relationships that we could discuss. How close were the olive trees to the production sites? Within kilometers. We have ethnographic material from the early 19th century that shows the area in which Ekron is located, Telmikna, uh, that there were olive groves in the immediate area. But we think most of the olive trees uh, do better in the low hills that were a few kilometers away. Was the stone quarried locally or was it transported? We found actually one quarry. It was difficult for us to, to uh, examine it closely because it was in a military zone. But there was a quarry within a half a kilometer of the site. How many acres does the site cover? Uh, originally, we thought the upper and lower city together was 10 and 40 um, acres. That would be 50 acres. But recently, we've expanded uh, the site northward. And we're almost at 85 acres because we found remnants of one of the walls in the wadi that we have to publish a new top plan of the, of the site, which had, wasn't reflected in the lecture. And to put that into comparison mode, that's a pretty big site for back then. Um, 85 acres is huge um, for this period. Um, Gezer, I think, was something like 27 acres. The top of Chatzor was 15. Dan was 40 acres. Lachish was in the high 20s. Okay. Do you have any idea? why Babylon destroyed Ekron instead of keeping it intact to produce olive oil? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We've been asking ourselves that question for years. And I once consulted Dam Damaya from Petersburg, St. Petersburg in Russia, um, who is the specialist in the Babylonian culture. And he said, this was his idea, and he published it mentioning Ekron in the process, that the Babylonians were not very sophisticated. They didn't care about the production center. They had only one goal in mind, and that was Egypt. And uh, they were destroying the bases along the way, whether it was Ashkelon uh, or Ekron. They were not really interested. They gave up a wonderful uh, production center that produced surpluses, that produced taxes, but they destroyed it. All right. I want you to join me in thanking again Cy Gittin. <laughs> Thank you.